Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Our goal is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences right around the world. On February 29th, Tyndale University and Seminary and the Henry Nouwen Society are co-hosting a special event at Tyndale University in Toronto. It's called A Day with Shane Claiborne. I hope you'll mark your calendars and plan to join us if you can. For more information about this one-day gathering, go to our website, henrynowen.org. If you don't know who Shane Claiborne is, let me introduce you to him in this podcast. Shane Claiborne is a prominent speaker, activist, and a best-selling author. Shane worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, and he founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia. He heads up Red Letter Christians, a movement of folks who are committed to living as if Jesus meant the things he said. I consider Shane to be on the cutting edge of faith, and in this inspiring podcast, Shane, a great fan of Henry Nouwen, tells us why the world needs more wounded healers like Henry. I was really struck as I listened to you, Shane, about the power of imagination, even the very fact that you said that, you know, you're as, what is it, you're as young as your dreams, as old as your cynicism. Mm. I want to know from you what you're dreaming about these days. Where is your heart going and uh, where is your cynicism or do you have any? Oh, well, I, I am. Uh, well, I have a coffee mug at my house that says Relentless Optimist on it. <laughs> so I get accused sometimes of seeing uh, through uh, being being a little, uh, seeing the world through rose-colored glasses, I guess. But I, I, mean, I do think there's a difference between optimism and hope. And I, I, I am incredibly hopeful right now and uh you know one of my friends is uh um faith is um believing despite the evidence and watching the evidence change you know and so i I think that i'm um there's so many people that are concerned about injustice and from the movement for black lives to the parkland students to uh, what hap- happened at, at Standing Rock? You know, I think there's just there's just an, an I think a new or a fresh sensitivity and kind of holy uprising, and it feels wonderful. So I'm I'm really uh, hope filled right now. Um, at the same time, I, I mean I I think that um, our country's really in a crisis right now, um, and there's many people that have mentored me that are. 80 years old that uh, I think see where we're at right now and it feels like we've, we've just been you know knocked back uh, a few decades uh, and, and, and so um, but I think all of this was there and, and that, that's why I've been saying you know that, that Trump didn't change America he's just revealing America and I think he's also not changing evangelicalism he's just revealing it and, and but sadly I think what we see is is very troubling, um, and we, we've we've lost our our grounding in Jesus. I think so. I'm I'm um, preaching Jesus these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to be centered. The, one of the first places that you and I met was on the phone, or maybe it was just in an email. I'm not sure, but I basically reached out to you saying, "Well, did Henry now and every mean anything to you?" And I loved what your response is, or your response was. Do you recall? What you no, had, tell me what I said. Well, you just said downward mobility. Of course, he means something to me. Yeah, and you had yeah. obviously done some reading. How had Henry now and impacted your life? Oh boy, there, there. I mean, there are so many ways. This this last week, I, my buddy and I were building some bookshelves in my room, in my office, because my, my wife said if I don't find a place for the books not to be on the floor, they're going to be donated. So, <laughs> but I'm looking through all of them, and I'm just seeing, you know, one after another of Henry's books, and and um, some of the first books we started reading. Um, as a community together, you know, were, were Henry's books. Um, so that, that I, I think one of the very um, fundamental values in our community is the idea that we're wounded healers, you know, and that certainly comes directly out of Henry's um, 
work in theology and and that idea that we we kind of those those among us who have bumps and bruises have often kind of been conditioned to think of them as liabilities whereas i think they actually are our credentials you know just as thomas you know saw jesus's scars i think that there's ways that the things that we have survived um, actually um, become a part of the testimony and even the power of um, love and grace and um, so, I mean, some of the, the most amazing people leading our community these days are, are wounded healers who have some pretty deep wounds, that um, things that they've survived. And, and that's, that's uh, our heartbeat, you know, is that the best folks to help women coming out of domestic violence are women that have survived domestic violence. The best folks to help folks recovering from heroin are, are folks that have been you know seven years clean and know the monster of addiction so I, I learn every day from our recovery community about my own addictions and recovery and um, and the power of, of what it means to be a wounded healer and, and that's something um, Henry taught and the prodigal uh, son I mean one thing after another of, of Henry's work you know has been really influential on us and yeah even the downward mobility from you know Harvard to uh, um, Larsh and I, I think I, I never made it to Harvard, but <laughs> I did drop out of Princeton, so that counts for something. But yeah, so I but but finding um, Jesus on the margins and maybe in the places I might not have expected to is is uh, um, exactly um, what, what I've learned from Henry. It's interesting because I think something that um, as I was listening to you today that I heard and um, which touched me and I think connects you too to Henry is your sense of love of community. Um, the reality being that I think it was a discovery for Henry. I think he was pretty lost and always longing to find where he belonged. And I think the role of community amongst those that weren't always whole, didn't weren't necessarily his equals intellectually, but when he found that community, he found life and he mm -hmm. found a sense of home. Tell me about how community is working for you and what it looks like and what, what kind of a contribution that makes to your, to your faith life and your faith work. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, community is one of those things that um, uh, it, it's, it's sort of in all of us, isn't it? We're created in the image of a God who reflects community, you know, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's this plurality of oneness. And when the first humans made, it's not really good until they're helping each other, you know, and Jesus saying, where two or three of you gather, I'm with you. So there's this, uh, this communal element, I think, that we're made to love and be loved. But it's, in some ways, it's kind of a lost art in, in our, in, like, uh, industrialized world of uh, Western, you know, uh, Christianity. I think we've, we've um, idolized individualism and independence. And, and in, in our community, we say um, independence is not a gospel value. Interdependence is a gospel value. Not, not codependence, but, you know, the fact that we need one another is a beautiful thing. And um, that communal dynamic we've we've built our life life around that you know we, we've been sharing money and life and cars and food and gardens and you know houses for 20 years now so and we learned that like I, I shared today you know by visiting some other communities that could help us you know with with uh, the tools for what that looks like because it's not always easy especially if you're new at it you know Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement she said we've got to create an environment where it's easier to be good <laughs> and, and it's a beautiful line. It, it doesn't just happen by moving a bump of, bunch of people in a house. You don't just have community, you know. So it needs structure, like just like uh, tomatoes in the garden. I think we need structure for community to flourish. So we learned our uh, by um, reading books like Henry's and Jean Vanier and others that were really helping us find um, community. And, and, and in some ways, it's like we're exercising muscles that have atrophied a little bit because I think we're made for community. We're made in the image of community. Uh, but we, we've um, often um, not practiced it enough, so you, you don't just run a marathon. I think, you know, you kind of start mm. uh, jogging a little bit and then <laughs> learn it as you go. One of the things that I hear in you is the influences of some of the Catholic, uh, I would say, important uh, uh, spiritual masters. And that's, I think, really interesting because you really bring together uh, 
something very ecumenical, something evangelical, uh, and yet it seems to be seeped with some traditions that come from the other side of the fence. We used to think of it as the other side of the fence, but we are now finding ourselves so very enriched by this. Would you share a little bit about what that has meant in, in your faith walk? Yeah, it's one of the reasons that it's not maybe that surprising that 10 years or so into um, our community living at the simple way, we began to put some of the pieces together of a prayer life that was ecumenical. And out of that was, I mean, ultimately came this book, Common Prayer, you know, that we, we did that has 50 songs from different traditions and it has different quotes all through it. And, and, and it also remembering history and uh, when Mandela was released from prison and Oscar Romero was killed and uh, when we dropped the atomic bomb, uh, the, the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, all those things are in there. But also we remembered the saints, you know, with a big S and a little S. So we remember folks, you know, that have influenced us. And I'm, I'm sure Henry's all in there, but there's the, you know, John Wesley, there's Dorothy Day, there's Oscar Romero, you know, so many different people all over the world and names that I didn't know because we were, we had Orthodox and Catholic and Anabaptist folks. So I, I've really become, um, uh, learned so much from the different streams. And part of what happened when we did this was we realized uh, as we were doing this prayer book, that there's 35,000 denominations of Christianity. <laughs> wow. And and yet Jesus' longest prayer is that we would be one as God is one. So that that's what we're really seeking. And one of my Catholic friends says, I keep seeing the, um, the Catholics becoming more Protestant and the Protestants becoming more Catholic. So there's, there's something to that, though, because I think what we saw is like, you know, we say we're Protestant, but half the word Protestant is protest, and we've forgotten where that even came from, and we, our, our roots don't go back enough that we, we're not Catholic enough to remember what we were protesting, you know, and, <laughs> and I think Catholics also, like, um, have a lot to learn from some of those renewals, and like the radical reformers, I mean, the more I've studied the Reformation, the more I see that, man, here we are, killing each other and you know the radical reformers the anabaptists and some of those they were the only folks that really seemed to be <laughs> grounded in the sermon on the mount so i yeah I, I but i i'm so glad to be mentored by um catholics uh, that i've known and others like henry that i never had the chance to meet but have really shaped my own spirituality that's lovely. Um, and I'm oh, loving the Pope. I'm ready, to, oh. I'm ready to meet the Pope. You know, I went and hang, hung out with uh, uh, Justin Welby, uh, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's like the Protestant Pope, but I'm still ready to meet Francis. So, <laughs> Isn't it great to have a moral leader <laughs> like that in our midst? I mean, really, he does cause you to go, thank you, God. Yeah, thank you, God. Right. You're really setting a standard there for us. Um, you got a new book, Executing Grace. Tell yeah. me, what is this all about? What is the most important cause before us right now for you? Well, I, I think that the Executing Grace is, is about, it's really about forgiveness and grace and restorative justice. And what does it look like to heal the wounds of violence in, in our world? And so it's also about the death penalty. And um, um, uh, because of, you know, as I looked at that, the, the, the death, death penalty is kind of like the, the lens that as you peel away the, loo, the layers of it, there's so much more that it un reveals to us. And for instance, like um, the death penalty wouldn't stand a chance in America if it weren't for Christians. And wherever Christians are most concentrated is where the death penalty um, has survived and flourished. So, I mean, we're, we're recording this in Texas, you know, and Texas is often called the, the buckle of the Bible belt, you know, it's, 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 it's where half the executions in our country um, are coming from this one state. And so, I, I you know, the, the fact that the Bible belt is the death belt really troubles me. And it's also true that there's this entire um, history of, of slavery and racism that um, we can't disconnect from that either. That the states that held on to the death penalty the longest are the same states that held on to slavery the longest. And where lynchings were happening a hundred years ago is where executions are still happening today. So all those things. But there's a theology, there's a spirituality to that as well. And um, and, and certainly one of the things I, I, I love uh, about Henry Nowen was, was how he began. He lived in a real, you know, with his feet on the ground, a real community. But he also knew that 
our spirituality um, should cause us to care about these bigger issues of life and injustice. And um, so I, I really believe that um, Christians can play a role in history um, when it comes to the death penalty. And this is the time, you know, it's like 80% of millennial Christians are against the death penalty. Um, millennial Christians, you know, that yeah. it's not in spite of their faith, but because of it. And Catholics have been a great voice in this, yeah. but like I said in the session, still, you know, half the Supreme Court are Catholics. We still have a lot of Catholics, you know, in the pews and parishes that, that um, could, could be a stronger voice for life. And and it's one of the things that I kind of grieve is that when we say pro-life, sometimes we would more appropriately say anti-abortion, you know, because we've so narrowly defined what it means to be pro-life. But to me, to be pro-life is is to care about every issue of life. And abortion is certainly one of those, but so is gun violence and racism and immigration and the death penalty. So I think it's it's ironic that in the United States you can say I'm pro-guns, pro-death penalty, pro-military, but pro-life, <laughs> as long as you're against abortion. So I, but what, you know, Mother Teresa and Henry and so many others and, and, and Pope Francis is doing for us now is that consistent life ethic. It says every person's made in the image of God. And, and if we're really going to be pro-life, that's more than just being pro-birth and, and more than just being anti-abortion. It means we want to champion dignity and life on every one of these issues. And, and ultimately, like, it's not about slogans and T-shirts and bumper stickers, but we need to create loving communities that can care for and nurture life and find alternatives to things like the death penalty. It sounds like you're doing that very much so in Philadelphia, but you're also sprinkling it as seeds all over the rest of us. And really, you make it so attractive. You do because it's mixed with wit, and it's mixed with a lot of kindness, a lot of warmth, a lot of uh, may not have it right, but let's do the best we can. And I really mm. appreciate that about you. Uh, I'm going to take you back one last time to Henry. And I just I'm curious what you think Henry might have to offer um, to this generation coming up? Do you think there's anything? I, I personally, I think of, of his incredible grasp of what it is to be beloved. Mm -hmm. What do you think we need to share with those that are kind of the, the generation coming up now? What do you feel they need to hear? Yeah, well, that it's interesting that you said that because I can remember, I think probably one of my first... Um, interactions um, with Henry's work was a college friend of mine that like I think it was like an old VHS cassette or something he was like sit down we got to watch this and he puts it on it's just Henry talking about the beloved you know and and we sat there and listened like uh, um, for what I mean in, in one way it flew by but I think it was quite a while that we just listened to him speak about how, you know this this idea that we're beloved and we you know even this morning I mentioned that you know we all need to hear that whisper and I think that's still a part of who we are is is that we we, we believe at the end of the day that we're made to love and be loved and when we understand that some of the other stuff gets a little bit easier and and, and when I think about what Henry his relevance and what he has to offer today. The, I hang out with a lot of young people, and what I'm finding is that they are not looking for Christians that are perfect, but they're looking for Christians that are honest. And Henry Nowen was honest. You know, I think he was wrestling with his own um, darkness, his own struggles, and... Um, and too often, I think a lot of Christians have acted like the church is a country club for saints, you know, and rather than a place for imperfect people to fall in love with a perfect God and try to help each other become uh, more like the, the one we love and worship, you know. And, and Henry, I think, does that for us. He certainly knew the perfection and love and mercy of God and, and his own struggles to be more like God. And community, I think, was a space where he... Um, could be continually reminded of his own belovedness, you know, and uh, um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's one of the greatest needs in the church, and that's why, you know, we have so many young people that love Jesus. They just aren't crazy about Christians, you know, because we've often looked very unlike our Christ. So Henry, Henry left off the fragrance of Jesus, and I'm, I'm so grateful for his life. 
I just want to say thank you so much, and I want to encourage people to buy the the latest book or any one of them. But I'm going to say Executing Grace because I think we could turn this around. Mm -hmm. I think we should turn it around. I think the time is right. Grace is needed in this. Thank you very much, Shane, for your time. Really appreciate this. Always wonderful to be with you. If you would like to hear Shane Claiborne in person, he's coming to Toronto on February 29th. Tyndale University and the Henry Nowen Society are partnering to give audiences a day with Shane Claiborne. You can find a link to the event on our website, henrynowen.org, or go to Eventbrite and look for A Day with Shane Claiborne. I hope you'll come to Toronto to be part of this very special gathering. Shane has been deeply influenced by the life and work of Henry Nowen, and when Shane speaks, it's out of the overflow of a very full heart and of a life of deep commitment to Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of Now and Then.